Great, so welcome everyone to our COVID-19 learning series for long-term care. Uh, my name is Emily Pridham and I'm a program manager in the long-term care program with Island Health and I'm the moderator for this series. I'll remind everybody that we are recording this session and the recording of it and the PowerPoint slides will be available afterwards. We'll get that posted um, shortly later this week or early next. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging again today that I am here as a visitor working on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen spe speaking people the Saanich, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt people. I know people are dialing in from other parts of the island, the Health Authority, and I really encourage you to take a moment to reflect on the land and the territory that you're joining us from today. I wanna to thank everybody for taking the time to join the learning series, um, whether you're joining us live here today or you're listening to us afterwards, and everybody has really busy work and schedules, so it's really um, valuable that you're taking this time to join us in this learning. Um, throughout this learning series, our purpose is to really help build your confidence and help you feel better prepared to work safely during an outbreak. The first two sessions that we did covered what to do in the event of an influenza outbreak and what you should be considering in terms of preparing for and containing a COVID outbreak on site. Um, the recordings for those first two sessions are posted on the intranet so you can access them afterwards if you haven't had a chance yet. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is that we do have a survey evaluation for this series. I'll post it shortly in the chat box and I encourage you to take some time throughout this session or shortly afterwards to give us that feedback through the survey. Uh, it really helps us organize and improve the series as we go. So today is the third session in our five-week series and today what we're talking about is what will happen if there's a COVID-19 outbreak in long-term care. And I'll just take a moment to say it's really timely that we're coming together today to talk about this. I'm sure you're all aware that we have had now two outbreaks in long-term care here on Vancouver Island. And um, I certainly know and have heard that there's a lot of anxiety, uncertainty, and fear about managing COVID-19 in long-term care. I also wanna say that what we have seen in our two sites uh, with outbreaks is that the staff have done an utterly exceptional job in ensuring those outbreaks are contained. And I think I'd appreciate if we all take a moment to thank those staff sincerely for how hard they've worked and the work that they're doing tire tirelessly to support um, the residents and themselves out there at Rainbow Gardens and Discovery Harbor. So huge thank you to all of you for the, for the work that you're doing and the impact that you're having. Um, so today's session, and I'll turn it over quickly to our guests, as I've said, is about what to do in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak in long-term care. We're fortunate to have Bevan Manhas here with us today, who's a, a manager and a colleague of mine working in the long-term care program. And she's been instrumental in helping us develop our, our plans and our response protocol. And she'll spend a few minutes talking about some highlights in the guidelines that we have. And then she'll be leading a session for you with some guest speakers to talk about these guidelines and how we're using them in long-term care. So we are we have the pleasure of having with us our MHO, Dr. Fife, our medical director, Dr. Manville, our director of long-term care, Carmela Betza, the director of IPAC, Lisa Young, and then we also have Ben Shaw with IPAC and Cheryl Bronin, who is a CD nurse here with us today to have a lively discussion, I'm sure, about managing an outbreak. So without further ado, Bevan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Emily. Okay, so I'm sure you're all so excited about learning what to do in a COVID outbreak. Uh, I'm sure many of you have attended sessions. Um, there's been a lot of learning series across different organizations and um, like the universities as well. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today will be um, based on our experience and in um, consultation with different health authorities, uh, what we've learned about managing an outbreak in long-term care. Um, just a side note, Emily, I don't see Cheryl on the line. So um, if she does come on, if you could make her a co-host, um, unless you have another name out there, Cheryl, uh, let us know. All right, so. Let me figure out how to use my PowerPoint. Hmm. Oh, 
There you go. Just have to click on it. <laughs> a good start. Okay. Um, so today's objectives, we're going to be talking very briefly. I want to review the COVID protocol. Um, many of you may have seen the document. Um, we're making some updates to it, trying to make it a little bit more user friendly as well, uh, so that you may be able to click on different sections and go right through it because it's quite an extensive um, and long document. But I'm going to very briefly review what do we do when we have a person under investigation for COVID or ILI? And then what is some of the consideration for COVID-19 positive? I want to make very clear the outline um, and outline the meeting structure and some of the discussions that we have during an outbreak um, for, of COVID-19. Want to briefly touch about the COVID response team and what they're um, typically responsible and how they support a site when it does go into outbreak. And then of course, we wanted an opportunity to touch base around common questions people had. I think uh, in the Slido, we've had, you know, some people not really going to that tool to, um, put their questions in but just based on some of the common questions we get every day uh, we've built this powerpoint around that so of course i think emily alluded to this in her intro and and we've talked about this um, the best and most important work that we can do is around prevention um, it's really really important especially with the number of cases that are um, starting to rise on the island that we're communicating out to our teams and encouraging them to continue doing their hard work around social, um, um, avoiding social gatherings, following the public health orders around sticking to your immediate household um, is the current direction right now. Um, making sure that staff are feeling supported when they're calling in sick. If they have any symptoms of COVID-19, and that's been the challenging piece because they're so nonspecific, um, but however mild, they should be supported to be uh, staying home. The physical distancing, of course, really important. We talked about this in a couple of our other sessions. Some of the key areas we're finding uh, there has been breaks um, in and promoting transmission is in things like break rooms. So really important that staff um, on site remember in the facility at all times they need to be having that two meter distance and of course wearing their masks, but as well in the community. Um, it really doesn't take much to have a breach in in um, uh, the uh, precautions. And so it's really important that even when in the community, uh, staff are really sticking to that physical distancing and two meters um, uh, guideline. Of course, I think Lisa would kill me if I didn't mention <laughs> hand hygiene and Ben and, and pretty much anyone who talks about infection control practices. Um, it's one of the cornerstones to all infection control practices, strict hand hygiene, really important. Um, make sure in our sites that we have available alcohol hand rub if needed. Um, make sure it's, it's as a system available to people when they're coming out of rooms before and after patient interactions, resident interactions. The other piece that we're doing in terms of prevention is that monitoring piece. Um, so important that we're assessing our residents every day and our staff to make sure that no one is developing any symptoms. And if they are, then ensuring the appropriate protocols are put into place. And of course, part of it has been restricting activities, um, external activities, um, even modifying a lot of the ways we're doing internal um, activities on sites um, and also limiting visitors. But we've, we've got another session to talk more details about visitors next week. Okay, what do you do when a person uh, develops symptoms? Um, and so we've developed this algorithm here, trying to make it a bit linear of what would I do if I'm a frontline nurse that's working with residents that develop uh, COVID or influenza-like illness symptoms. So of course, the biggest piece is that we need to make sure we're screening everyone daily and if a resident meets any of the criteria here and the threshold is very low in long-term care. Um, if they screen um, positive to these symptoms, then they would meet case definition for uh, uh, COVID-19 um, and they would be considered a person under investigation. The most responsible nurse, so the nurse that's assigned to caring for that resident, um, should ensure, number one, that you want to put the resident on isolation. 
So that's droplet and contact precautions um, and make sure that the outbreak protocol restrictions are initiated. Um, in our response protocol, we have a lot of details about what that means in terms of tray service, um, activity limitations, um, and then also consulting with communicable disease or your infection control practitioner um, if you have any other concerns or questions specifically about that resident. Uh, the other piece is making sure that that resident is going to be tested. Uh, the preference is with a nasopharyngeal swab. We do have in our response protocol, we've updated and on the internet, there's a really great video for staff that maybe have not done an NP swab and they're worried about it. There's a really great video on uh, our website and we'll send that out and it'll be in our uh, updated response protocol of how to actually obtain that swab. Um, it's not always a comfortable thing, but that really is the best um, tool to use to determine um, if they're, they're positive. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the limitations to testing and what does it actually mean, the result, once we get it, if it's negative. The other piece of nurse um, really important is to consider are there any other residents with symptoms, whether they're in that same neighborhood, in the same wing, or in the facility. Um, and it's not just residents. We want to know if staff are also developing symptoms because that gives us a bit more um, of a picture of what could be going on in a site and may indicate if you've got more than one person that you want to be communicating with communicable disease or infection control uh, for a little bit more guidance. Oops. The other piece I just want to point out with our residents in long-term care, um, like I said, the, the symptom list for COVID-19 is, is quite um, wide and it's important to recognize with our generally more frail uh, older adults that we serve in long-term care, although it's not all older adults, um, there is a more common occurrence of atypical symptoms, um, a hypoactive delirium. So someone who just seems a lot more sleepy than normal, they don't um, seem themselves, have a, have a high suspicion uh, and a low threshold for isolating and swabbing individuals. Um, if the test comes back negative, we'll talk a little bit about, um, again, the test results, but um, it would be important to, for the nurse to connect with the most responsible provider to ensure um, that there isn't still a high consideration for COVID. Was there exposure risk? Have that discussion. But otherwise, this, the isolation should really continue until those symptoms are resolved. Uh, if you do have questions, again, there's infection control and communicable disease um, that you have processes already for. And I won't go into the COVID positive because we'll talk about that after. Okay, now has Cheryl joined us? Not yet, okay. Well, we still have Murray in our infection control um, specialist. So I'm gonna um, start changing this to a little bit more of an interactive um, discussion about COVID and outbreak management. So I think some of the questions that I've noticed people ask about is, around the uh, process once someone is confirmed COVID-19 positive via a lab uh, uh, result, i.e. the NP swab. So my question, Lisa, Ben, Murray, um, if you wanna comment on what happens when a resident or staff member is confirmed COVID-19 positive, like what is the process from communicable disease? Okay, so you said Cheryl's on the phone, so I'll, I'll uh, start answering and, and Ben and Lisa can jump in. Um, so, yeah, so I'm the medical health officer and uh, we have a team of communicable disease nurses um, that uh, work closely with our affiliate uh, long-term care facilities. And then, of course, um, um, infection control works more closely with the uh, amalgamate facilities. So, um, but in, in, in any case, all of the COVID test results come through our offices very quickly after they've been positive. So if the Island Health Lab identifies um, anybody as being positive for COVID, our nursing staff know about it. And because we're getting more and more of these every day, we're up to uh, you know in the 20s per day now, uh, we're prioritizing who we follow up with. If they see on the lab result that it's anything to do with a healthcare worker or a long-term care facility, then that's a priority for following up with right away. And um, so if we determine the person is a healthcare worker, then um, the, the, uh, the communicable disease program will 
immediately determine the period of infectiousness, which depends when the person's symptoms started, determine if they worked in the facility while they were infectious, and if they did, then right away we're going to notify the long-term care program and we will initiate the steps for um, outbreak response. If it's a resident, we get a positive result back on a resident, you're probably in the facility is going to hear about it very quickly as well because you are able to access the results for your residents. And the same thing would happen once we know through our communicable disease program that we have a positive result for a resident, uh, we would notify long-term care and the outbreak response protocol would uh, be initiated and we would start having a teleconference probably within an hour. So that's our initial steps. Thanks, Murray. Ben, Lisa, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I, as, as Dr. Fife said, that uh, there's, there's a very quick response. Uh, I think to, for, any, for anyone uh, of your residents who, uh, if, it, if it is a resident, um, if we've done screening on them, they'll have been on additional precautions from the time that we identified potential symptoms. But um, we would be getting into a lot more detail about the additional precautions and starting outbreak protocols, which would include potentially looking at screening other residents. We'd be looking at putting more people on precautions, uh, looking if it was staff, the, you know, obviously looking at anyone they've been in contact with, um, uh, uh, tray service, uh, and, and, and all of those things. So there would be meetings to, to make sure we're all on the same page with all these measures. Yeah, and to highlight, you know, I think it's really important that everyone understands there's a process in place that in order for us to declare an outbreak and go through all the measures, the communicable disease nurse has to go through and do their investigation so we can really understand the context and provide appropriate direction for that specific um, individual. Um, it can get quite complicated, so it does take a bit of time to do the investigation, but rest assured, the turnover time is still very good on the island. and. Um, um, we're working really quickly um, to notify the right parties and, and make sure the right direction is coming to a site. The other piece I just wanted to highlight, as, as Murray had said, the requisition, really important when you're filling out the requisition, when you have a person under investigation to highlight that they're coming from a long-term care facility, so the LTCF. Um, if your site is already on outbreak, there's also the OBK that you would write on there. So we've put those in the, in the outbreak protocol as well. Another tip is just to really make sure that you put the site name. Important to label the swabs appropriately so they can get processed in a timely manner and there's no issues with that. Um, so just another question, in terms of contact tracing, and I don't know if Ben, if, if you wanna talk a little bit about this, but what information is it helpful for sites to have prepared when a communicable disease nurse or an infection control practitioner um, is contacting them to do the, the tracing? Well, we're, we're definitely looking for, for people, uh, I guess it, it's a little different for staff. So staff, obviously we wanna know their assignments and their shift schedules, other staff that they worked with. Um, and and we have we have a it's a combined effort. So OHNS is going to be following up with staff. From an IPAC perspective, we're focused on resident and patient safety, um, and the communicable diseases people are are working with the general public and and the community family uh, contacts out in the world. But we would want to you know collect that story. Where where's this person been? Who have they been with? Uh, particularly, what's the risk of of body fluids exposure contact and and uh, uh, what PPE was worn and I think it's really important from from the bit of experience we've had so far as to that it's not punitive we really just need to know like what what were, were they wearing a mask or not um, we, we really need to know if it's what what the reality was uh, because stories will come out from other staff anyway, and it just it just makes the uh, follow up more confusing. So those are, those are details that we need to know, like uh, to to determine who may have been in contact, and you know which residents need to be on precautions, potentially swabbed, and how how big to draw the circle, how many people are going to be in that circle. And I think what I've noticed. Um 
and Margaret chime in as well, but it's important not just to know, it's, it's important to do the contact tracing of visitors that have come in through, but also what allied health have come through the facility in the last um, few days in that infectious period. We need to know what physicians or nurse practitioners have come to see their patients because there's implications for them in terms of what degree of exposure risk they may have had, and they might need direction in terms of should we be recommending they adhere to a single site or self isolate, etc. Um, so really important that you have good processes on site for keeping a contact list. Um, I think we've been recommending with our greeter protocol that you have um, all your staff or your staff, your visitors, anyone coming through the door, have their phone numbers ready too, because the moment an outbreak happens, uh, leadership, you get really wrapped up in, in managing a lot of anxiety and, and doing following through a lot of tasks. So anything you can have prepared ahead of time, it just makes it really easy for us then to get that information out in a timely manner. Um, Okay. Just to add to that yes, as right. well, uh, but then it's also important to know where staff move around the facility because when we're contact tracing, we're also looking at that pathway around the residence and quite often you get staff moving from one side to another or from one neighborhood to another to help out. And again, we need to know that early on in the, in the investigation so that we can do that full um, contact tracing, but also put precautions in the appropriate places. Yep. Okay. The other thing, I think, Ben, you kind of touched on this in terms of how, how do we determine um, who is an exposure or contact of a case? And Ben, Lisa Murray, if you want to comment on that. I, I pulled here the things that you see is from a guideline, and guidelines are guidelines. Um, and so it does require clinical discretion, and, and these are conversations that we have as a group. But yeah, what do you, yeah. What do you consider for exposures? Yeah, so it's Marie here. Um, so the um, our communicable disease nurses, uh, unfortunately Cheryl couldn't uh, be with us uh, today, but uh, they're really experienced at doing this. They, they they do this type of thing all the time, both for COVID now and for a number of other you know, pathogens. Um, so they're good at finding out who is a close contact, and that's based upon the type of exposure, how long it lasted for, um, and whether personal protective equipment was being used. Um, and so in a healthcare setting, we have a very uh, good guidelines that's posted on the BC Centre for Disease Control website that, that helps us to determine whether a healthcare worker has had a, uh, a low risk exposure, a medium exposure, or a high risk exposure. And so that's going to help us to figure out whether that person should maybe be off work and isolating at home or whether they just need to follow them to make sure that they don't develop any, any symptoms. And we do the same thing, sorry, I would say for for out of work contacts, um, you know, if someone's been spending time with friends or family, um, we have a protocol that we go through to determine if someone that they may have been in contact with is considered close or, or a low risk contact and, you know, whether that person needs to be isolating at home or not in the uh, community. Yeah, and I think we've had a lot of people um, you know, I think once the word gets out someone's COVID-19 positive, there's a lot of anxiety about, I walked past this person and I did this. And um, a lot of people get very anxious about, you know, are they, should they be self-isolating? I think that's why it's so important to allow that contact tracing and support that contact tracing process to happen. Because once the communicable disease nurse um, is able to uh, gather that information, more clear direction can be given as to who is high risk. There are people even if you've worked in the facility that can be no risk um, but it requires us to get that information so we can give the proper guidance and um, th there are a, a lot of conversations I guess around eye protection so we've just got the new eye protection requirements out now in addition to the mask rules and that is all around uh, bringing your exposure risk down to no risk or low risk uh, when because in a lot of these situations we you may have worked with a staff member or resident who was pre-symptomatic and so that's why these things are uh, routine now wet masks and eye protection so I hope that oh it hasn't changed in long-term care but but the the mask requirements yeah those are the, those routine practices that we're following are, are about reducing your risk and keeping you safe, which is helpful in, you know, in hindsight. 
So as, as Ben has just said, we we not change the the eye protection in in routine, but as those who've experienced the the recent outbreaks, as soon as we've declared the outbreak, we have our staff to wear their eye protection um, in the outbreak, and that's that's as Ben says, it's to reduce that risk of exposure because we don't know whether there's there's any other. Um, residents or the staff that uh, that have acquired the uh, acquired COVID, and uh, and we just need to make sure. And while we're during the uh, the outbreak um, period, thank you. All right. Okay, communication. So, um, I think another highlight of of what I've learned is how important communication is uh, before in preparedness um, really making sure that all the staff and everybody in your facility really understands what is the protocol and and what are the processes you have in place I think the more transparent you can be about that that can be really helpful in um, reducing the anxiety when people understand uh, the level of preparedness that we've undertaken um, to manage these outbreaks. Um, so I guess this one will go to Ben, Lisa, uh, Murray. If I'm a healthcare worker and I've tested uh, positive for COVID-19 and I've not heard anything from anyone, what should I do? And I think this is also part of people are getting notified by text message and then they worry, okay, I'm positive, but it's been a couple hours, I haven't heard from anybody. Okay, well, I'll start again. Um, so you will hear from somebody if you're if if you're anybody um, at all, you will hear from us. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we prioritize when we're, when we're getting a large number coming in at any moment in time. We do prioritize. So healthcare workers will be called fairly quickly. It shouldn't be too many hours um, before they before our our communicable disease team is attempting to uh, to reach them. The difficulty may be if you get a late evening text that your uh, result is positive. Um, you might not hear from someone until the next uh, morning, um, but uh, the best advice is to, and it's, it, this is included on the text message, is to continue isolating and continue having members in your household isolating as well. Thanks, Murray. Yeah, and I think it was interesting. I was talking to someone in communicable disease um, because once you've been swabbed, say you've developed symptom and you've gone ahead and gotten tested, it's really important that you self-isolate while you're waiting for those results if you're symptomatic. Um, and I did hear that, you know, we've there's been people in the communities, um, you know, on the mainland where it's difficult to get a hold of them. And some people have been out and about because they just don't think that they have COVID. And one, it's challenging because communicable disease needs to be able to get in touch with you as soon as possible to start that contact tracing process. But really, again, highlighted, if you do have symptoms and you're awaiting testing, make sure that you're self-isolating. We'll talk a little bit in a minute about the difference when it comes to an outbreak site and you're being tested um, because of that. That's a different uh, reason. But if you're symptomatic and you're waiting for testing, please self-isolate. Um, so as a staff nurse, who do I need to notify about a resident? Oh, Lisa, yes, please. And also, if you're symptomatic, and you get a negative result, you still need to stay off work because you're ill. Yeah. So you, you need to stay off work until you, your symptoms have resolved or for five days until, so either, either whichever comes first. Oh, sorry. Um, just because we need you to, uh, we need, there are other viruses around, particularly at this time of the year. Thank you, Lisa, great point. Um, so if you're a staff nurse and you find out that a resident is positive, um, just this picture here is our outbreak management um, escalating communication. Um, we've a, this is the adapted one that's gonna come in the new response protocol on um, early next week. And so as a most responsible nurse, you need to make sure that you're, um, if it's during the day, get your clinical nurse leader or your supervisor involved and make them aware that um, this resident is positive. Of course, you wanna make sure like we talked about before that everyone is on the appropriate isolation precautions and all the other outbreak restrictions you know they're not leaving their room to go to activities or having meals etc um, and uh, it would be important that then your supervisor is letting the manager the director of care um, the site manager know because they need to let 
uh, there's Carmela sitting there, um, our director of, of long-term care know so that we can pull together all the key people that need to come together and have conversations, um, figure out what's happening in this outbreak so that we can give really good direction. So Murray's often one of our medical health officers, but we've got a number of them on the island that will work with us um, based on the geography around what is the outbreak situation. We typically have our communicable disease nurse, um, Dr. Kibsey, our infectious disease or um, infection control director and, and medical microbiologist is also involved in those conversations. And, and we will pull together an emergency outbreak teleconference so that all of these people can have a conversation about what is the direction that needs to happen um, around the clinical management as well as um, specific operational um, considerations. Um, and then we've now taken from Fraser, we've started to have daily outbreak coordination um, centers because as you know, we've had two outbreaks in our uh, on the island and so being able to discuss both of them with all the key people there um, again as as things are happening every day questions are coming up from the site we need to be able to provide that clear direction um carmela uh, can you yeah sorry just in terms of who to notify i think the other one person that needs to be notified is the primary care provider for the resident or the or the client yes that's a great point. And here, it would be really important for any manager, director of care, make sure you've got your medical coordinator's contact information and the MRPs. Um, if your site has had a specific process that you know, you're going to call the medical coordinator instead of the MRP, make sure that's clear for the staff um, and that contact information is readily available. It's really important for our medical providers to be on the call so that we can have conversations about medical management. Okay, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to mention that, Murray. Um, the other thing is that we did develop that SBAR, which has the information for the emergency outbreak um, teleconference. Um, so the um, SBAR, which has, you know, that you can send to the MRP notifying them of um, the, um, the COVID positive result if they don't have it already, you probably phone them, but this also has the phone number on it. But I was just on call a few weeks ago and at least half of the SBARs that I received did not have the updated version. So please use the updated version of the SBAR um, because it does have that 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 extra um, in notification of the telephone number. Um, because I know in a, in a in a stressful situation, sometimes those things are forgotten. Um, and um, be really appreciated if you could send that along to the to the MRP and and to the medical coordinator. Actually, thanks, Margaret. Um, Carmela, do you want to comment a little bit around how do we, how does communications work in Island Health and, and how do we let families, residents, what does that look like? Okay, thanks, Bevan. Um, so, uh, as you can well imagine in any outbreak, uh, communication is, is key, both to uh, getting information from the site to the emergency uh, uh, center uh, and for us to be able to support a site. But what's really important is to ensure that the information is getting out to the families um, and to the residents. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, the families and residents, as well as we know that there is a lot of public uh, um, curiosity and uh, wanting to know when there is an outbreak in, in a facility. So it's also letting the, um, the community know and letting the families know. Um, sorry about that. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that when there's an outbreak, we also have to communicate with the Ministry of Health and any communication we are sending out publicly will get approved by the, um, will be approved by the Ministry. The Ministry also won't allow um, or won't, it doesn't want us to send any information out publicly until they are assured that the families of that site have been notified. So as you can imagine in a stressful situation when there's been an outbreak declared, everybody's in a bit of a frenzy. So we do work really closely with our communications uh, partner uh, partners. Um, Dom has been uh, the one, Dom Abassi has been sort of relegated to the long-term care and he will work with the site uh, to help uh, a script uh, some communication if that site requires that, that will then go out to the families he will then take care of, of doing the uh, public notification as well as sending to the ministry for final approval. Thanks, Carmela. And, and I think you brought up a good point of like, 
because notification is happening through text, there's anxiety, uh, people are worried about outbreaks, etc. There's a lot of communication going out, we've seen in social media, etc. It's important to talk to teams and, and um, talk to, to the to staff and, and to your colleagues about it. We need to make sure we uphold professionalism and confidentiality um, when it comes to these outbreak situations and we need to focus on what are the facts of the situation and that's where as leaders of facilities um, have those pre proactive conversations with staff and, and let them know what what's kind of appropriate and what's not. Even if you're not um, talking about a specific patient, our, our MHO Dr. Enns had really eloquently put this during one of our simulations about you still have to uphold confidentiality and not disclose information um, about outbreaks um, when it's not appropriate to. Um, we really rely on staff upholding that professional conduct in their communication um, because we do have processes around communication. We are going to disclose to the public. There's no hiding of information here. It's just that it takes time to go through the processes. Yeah, that's a really good point, Bhavan, because um, that certainly, you know, has happened in, in smaller communities where it gets out on social media, the whole story is not out there, and people start to panic. And um, we don't want to be creating uh, any more distress for anybody in our communities. Um, so it really is important to have those conversations. I totally agree. And they should be part of the huddles, you know, that, that um, our, our uh, leadership is having with the staff on the site. Okay, I'm looking at our time. So I've got a few questions. I might skip a few of the questions on the slide so we can get through a couple more topics here. So in terms of the testing strategy, um, Lisa, Ben, um, Dr. Fife, if you want to comment on um, how do we, one, decide, Dr. Fife, how do we decide on who are we going to test? Um, when it comes to swabbing? Are we going to test everybody? Are we going to test a select few residents? What, what goes into that decision? And then uh, Lisa and Ben, if you could just talk about um, what does a negative result mean? And uh, I think Lisa, you'd already mentioned before about what should one do if they're in an outbreak situation, they've been told to swab, uh, get a swab done, but they don't have symptoms. So start with Dr. Fife. Okay, so first, first of all, I'll just say that um, we're told over and over again in the microbiologist, Dr. Kisby, Kimsey and all our microbiologists say, don't test asymptomatic people. Don't test asymptomatic people. The, the test is not good for asymptomatic people. But there's an exception. There's a few exceptions. And one of them is when we have an, um, an exposure or an outbreak in a facility. We do test uh, both the residents or patients and staff. And we try to do this strategically. So we look at uh, if it was a staff person, like most of the initial cases are, we do try to look at who they have been in contact with and see if there's a select number of people that it makes sense to test both healthcare workers that they work alongside and patients or residents that they've cared for. Um, so if we can do that strategically, we will. If the um, number of individuals that they've worked with and potentially been close to in terms of staff, like in the um, meeting rooms and things like that, we're, we're sharing care around residents or patients. Um, if it's fairly large, then we're likely to just say, we're gonna test all uh, staff um, in that particular unit. And the same thing with uh, residents. If uh, there's a situation where a healthcare worker, when they're infectious for a day, only work with one resident or two residents, then we might be able to get away with just starting off testing them. On the other hand, if they cared for residents throughout the whole unit or whole neighborhood, then we may have to do a broader testing strategy. So the short answer is that it depends. That's healthcare. <laughs> yes, thanks, Murray. Lisa, Ben, do you want to comment on what does a negative result mean and, and what's our guidance for staff that are asked to get tested in an outbreak but don't have symptoms? So I'm sure uh, Dr. Pfeiffer or Dr. Kipsi can, uh, can explain this much better than I can, but a negative swab can, uh, isn't necessarily negative, um, especially either in the very early stages of disease or um, pre pre infectious period as we as we call it um, so if we are doing that um, that's point prevalence that, that dr five just mentioned and we're screening asymptomatic staff and, and residents um, which we've done recently 
um, and people come back negative, it may be that they're, they've only just had contact with somebody who's positive and we're just not picking up enough virus um, or the, you know, the person has not got enough virus there. They're certainly not feeling ill. They've not got enough virus there for us to identify it. Um, so that that negative is only as good as that moment that we've taken it that does not mean that they will not develop symptoms um in the near future um and that is why we we still allow people to come back to work at that point but that's why we have everybody in their full ppe and why it's so important that people wear their mask and their eye protection at work and and still physically distance and things like that so that's where um why we do um do this the swabbing at various different points and and those who've been involved in some of the the outbreaks recently have noticed that we may get a result um at a, a separate point prevalent point and we go that's fine that's connected to that first round of, of swabbing but we found it later and it just so happens that um, the person is now has enough virus or is ill and, uh, and we're now picking it up at this point. Equally, if somebody is symptomatic and as I, as I alluded to earlier, if somebody is ill and has uh, respiratory symptoms and gets a, a negative result, that does not mean that they should be at work. They may have another respiratory virus and they, uh, they do need to stay away from work in that situation. Thanks, Lisa. So if I'm a care worker and I've been asked to go get swabbed, this is one of the clarifications we had to have is it is still safe for you to come to work provided you remain without any symptoms yep. um, because you've been asked to do this as part of the outbreak testing strategy. Um, but you should still have a, a, a low threshold. And, and if you develop any symptoms, however mild, you should book off work. Let yep. your manager know so that we can make sure testing is, is organized or direction from communicable disease can be given. Um, and make sure that you're wearing your PPE, like Lisa is saying, your hand hygiene, um, really important not to have those breaches. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, if, and we still got a couple slides to go through. If you have to go, please, into the panel as well, thank you. Um, but I do wanna, if you are able to stay, then that's great. Hopefully it won't be only a few more minutes. Um, outbreak management. So what do we do as leaders and frontline workers to ensure we can manage the outbreak successfully and i think at the outside um, outset of this presentation emily mentioned that you know despite there being some challenges at a couple of our sites um, who've been on outbreak uh, the last few weeks they've done a really extraordinary job of taking care of the residents um, they've done a really good job in terms of containing um, uh, the outbreak and some of the things that were done that were really great is they followed the outbreak restrictions. Um, so like Ben mentioned, making sure the re residents are on the right precautions, um, isolation um, is occurring, admissions and transfers were closed in the building, um, uh, signage and housekeeping was enhanced, um, and we've been having lots of communication with the site to make sure that any questions that they have, we can provide some direction. Um, and Dr. Fife and Dr. Enns have been really fantastic, as well as the rest of the team in terms of um, Lisa, Dr. Kipsey, uh, our long-term care leadership, uh, Dr. Manville as well. The other things that they did really well is cohorting staff and cohorting residents. It would be good if you haven't prepared around this to think about if you had an outbreak and it was on one side of the facility, how would you cohort your staff and how would you schedule your staff so that you can make sure that they stay separate, that maybe a high risk area is staffed only by a certain number of people and everybody else is separate. This means separate med rooms, separate washrooms, separate entrances or, or, or changing um, areas. Um, cohorting residents that um, might be high risk or, or whatnot so that they're kept separate from the rest of the environment. And I think that's particularly important um, for all the outbreaks, but especially when you have residents in multi bedrooms, et cetera. Um, having physically distanced huddles and ongoing communication with the team um, 
one of our sites was having very good communication regularly. They both were actually. Um, our COVID coach was there, part of our response team. And I think that was really helpful for that ongoing communication, making sure everybody's on the same page um, and, and ascribing to the same um, outbreak plan. Adherence to PPE, we've also taken something from um, Fraser Health where they're doing these um, PPE and, and uh, prevention audits. We're trying to not call them audits because we don't want people to get scared of the term, but they're reviews. They're meant to be a, a toolkit to help you identify where might be some of the high risk areas that we need to address on site so that we can make sure that there's not going to be um, any breaks in transmission or breaks in um, uh, breaches or uh, enhanced transmission happening. Um, one of the tips I think I keep hearing from, from Fraser and, and um, our sites here that have gone through outbreak is make sure that you have a buddy system in terms of the PPE. So you're watching each other and making sure that um, you're not having any breaches in the PPE. It's a supportive model. It's not meant to be punitive. Hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. Try to get those pumps out, create stations so that staff don't have the opportunity to forget to wash their hands between patient uh, interactions. Um, one of the key things Dr. Kipsey had um, passed on this past week was uh, a study that she said um, two of the most uh, common inanimate objects that were known to um, uh, have enough microbes to cause COVID transmission were the iPads because of the virtual care, et cetera, as well as vital science machines. So really important for you to think about how do you wash those um, or disinfect them and what are the processes around using them um, so that we're making sure we're not passing around the virus through these two objects. Again, that ongoing clinical surveillance, once an, a facility is in outbreak, you need to monitor the residents twice daily. So that includes asking all those questions. Screening is not just a taking a temperature, it's also connecting with that resident and depending on their, their status, um, cognitively as well, but asking, are they having any signs or symptoms, having that low threshold for isolating them um, and swabbing if they haven't been part of that initial strategy. Um, medical management. So we have, um, Margaret and I have been working on a clinical order set, I think that is nearly um, ready uh, and has been gone, going around for um, some uh, review with the MAC, the Medical Advisory Committee. Margaret, I'm hoping you might just want to comment on what have you been hearing about what's the prognosis for residents who develop COVID-19? Thanks, uh, Bhavan. So the prognosis at the beginning of the pandemic uh, was that uh, the mortality rate was about 25 to 35 percent. Um, that means a lot of your residents are going to get ill, but a lot of them are also going to recover from this virus. So 70, you know, 70, 65 to 75 percent of your residents. I think it's actually better now um, in the most current sort of outbreak settings because of improved training for PPE, donning and doffing, and awareness of, of those practices, um, and, um, and also awareness of how to cohort residents and separate staff. So um, I think in uh, Vancouver Coastal, when I was speaking to uh, Dr. Tucano, it sounded like it was about 20% for them. Um, Maria, I don't know if you have any different numbers, but that sounds more up to date, um, at least locally. Um, and um, the the clinical order set uh, is being uh, adjusted for, adjusted, it's going through the uh, uh, CPOE process, so as it, with all of our, our order sets. So um, this order set that Tabavid and I have been looking at is um, adapted from Fraser Health. We are changing it to suit our needs, so there's, it, it's going to look a bit different. Um, but the big things on there is that conservative management is for most of our residents. So the mild symptomatic residents um, who are not requiring oxygen, that would be a severely ill COVID-19 resident, um, they require supportive treatment. So TLC, fluids and rest and um, fever management if they have a fever um, and, and, and their regular care. I think, you know, our, obviously our residents are at most risk if staff aren't showing up. So that was another reason that mortality was higher at the beginning of the pandemic is that it wasn't just 
that people were dying from COVID-19, but they were dying from the effects of the, of the outbreak on the entire facility. So staffing and people not being able to get what they need as far as hydration, um, oral intake, medications, um, uh, you know, transferring, um, getting, getting, you know, making sure that pressure ulcers aren't developing, et cetera. So that's really important. Um, and the severely, there is some guidance if a resident <clears throat> is, remains in the facility and becomes severely ill and requires oxygen, that um, for consideration of, uh, depending on their most and their goals of care, um, that steroids, um, either prednisone or dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is what's indicated in the studies, but a lot of our sites don't stock that. Actually, I would say almost none of them stock that, but they do stock uh, prednisone mostly, often in their contingency um, medications that can be ordered easily. So um, the, these guidelines that we're, we're putting together are right from the BCCDC uh, guidelines, and they have suggestions about long-term care. So they are suggesting that if there's a severely ill resident to consider, it doesn't have to, we don't have to treat, but to consider steroids, to consider um, if there's a suspicion of bacterial infection for whatever reason, um, there's some suggestions around um, antibiotic treatment, if that's consistent with their goals of care. Um, and the other thing that they have recommendations about is um, uh, venous uh, thromboembolism uh, prevention um, or prophylaxis. So there is some, some guidance around there, no suggestions for medications, but more to just consult with, um, with colleagues in internal medicine or other disciplines if that's something that would be considered for that resident. But again, that was taken right from the BCCDC uh, guidelines. Thanks, Margaret. I think the other topic on this slide that I think especially this week and the last two weeks I think people have been very anxious about is our AGAMPs. Um, in terms of what is best practice, best practice is to stop AGAMPs um, wherever possible. Um, there are some occasions and it tends to be with residents who are on BiPAPs um, where it may not be clinically appropriate to stop that therapy. We've sent out guidance this week that in the event a resident with a BiPAP becomes a person under investigation, um, if that therapy cannot be stopped, they would be considered to need airborne isolation, which requires the facility to have um, staff fit tested. That has been very challenging because in long-term care, we haven't typically fit tested. Um, we are updating the guidelines that will again come out early next week um, to make sure that you have some more clear guidance, but essentially um, the best practice is to stop it. And like, talking to Dr. Takano over in Vancouver Coastal, they've had a lot of success with being able to stop or hold. Um, I've talked to even um, uh, colleagues here on the island and there has been the ability to Residents have tolerated uh, their BiPAPs being held while they're uh, a person under investigation. But again, like Margaret mentioned, um, for some of the therapies, um, we do have a respiratory therapist at Aberdeen that can consult, but also respirologists on call, internal medicine if needed. Margaret. Yeah, and I was just going to say, if you're holding the uh, CPAP or the BiPAP, you can use the nocturnal oxygen um, as a stopgap. So we, I think um, a person under investigation this week in the Mid-Island, um, they did that and it was very successful. So there are ways around it. Um, so the best practice, like Bob and said, is to stop the AGMP. And the one other tip that I'd, I want to share here is um, in our outbreak management, Dr. Kipsey, our medical microbiologist, um, commented it would be important to, uh, as a medical coordinator or, or MRP, talk with the medical coordinator about reviewing all residents, even the asymptomatic ones, um, around you know, what are their investigations that are coming into house? What is actually clinically essential? What medications are, are clinically essential? Where can we make some modifications to um, ensure that um, uh, there's no, you know, people coming into the building that don't need to be there? Um, so uh, that's just another tip in terms of what should I be kind of considering as a role as a medical coordinator? And, and lab work? testing as well, sorry, just that, that was the other piece yeah. that Dr. Kipsey had reminded us is that labs are often coming in for routine reasons and, and if there's a reason to do a lab, obviously that's important, um, but if, there's, if it's a routine lab that can, can wait, that should absolutely wait until the outbreak is declared over. Almost done here. <laughs> um, in terms of transfers, so 
can we just, uh, Dr. Fife, uh, Carmela, Lisa, Margaret, can you comment on, you know, how do we decide whether a resident um, needs to be transferred to acute care? And then what is the communication that needs to happen with that? Okay, I'll just say briefly, and then maybe um, Dr. Mandel can fill in a few more details. So there's, I think there's really two points of decision about whether we consider moving a resident out. And, and the first um, is based upon the client, the patient's um, uh, advanced um, scope of treatment uh, directives. And then the second reason, and, and their clinical course. And then the second reason might be, there may be very specific situations for outbreak control where we might consider moving a a resident, um, but that would have to be very, very specific where it makes sense that it's going to limit further spread within the facility. And that often, I think, the finding from, say, Surrey or Fraser Health has not been the case where it would not make a big difference to move the resident out. So I'll stop there and turn over to Dr. Mabo. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think you know we've had that experience this week, and, and I think there was the right choice for the residents to be transferred, um, and it caused some difficulties with communication and just understanding what the goals of that um, transfer were, and it was really for outbreak control, um, because there was a, a few identified residents, and um, and there was other considerations at the site, and I, I, I would stand by that uh, decision that we all made together that this was important for the resident. Um, the second consideration is obviously the most status. So um, if a resident is um, most indicates that if the symptoms that they're having exceed the capacity of the site to manage those symptoms, and that it's keeping with the goals of care, um, that they could be transferred to acute care. If that decision's made, the MRP and the MHO need to have that discussion. The MHO needs to be aware, um, supportive of that transfer. And then the MRP also needs to, to communicate with um, uh, the COVID positive cohort unit if that's where they're going. Um, you know, obviously a COVID positive resident could fall and break their hip too. We haven't had that scenario, but you know, there is going to be sort of some considerations for depending on what the issue is for the transfer. Um, but uh, MRP to MRP communication needs to happen. And then there's other communication that happens sort of above us. Uh, Carmela, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Well, certainly when we do the, um, uh, the, um, the first emergency outbreak meeting, depending on what some of the decisions are made at that time, based on the, the medical information, the information uh, from the medical health officer, um, you know, depending on what decision happens at that time, we then involve the rest of the health authority because it will impact. If we're going to transfer, it will impact um, the, the other parts of the, uh, the health authority, i.e. acute care. Um, so notifying them uh, as to what's happening. Um, you know, we have talked about uh, and we've done plans around, you know, we would keep people, we would transfer people up to a certain number. Once we got to a, a particular number greater than five residents, we would no longer be looking to transfer unless they were clinically um, clinically required uh, to be transferred. But the other thing we have to remember is we're part of a very large system that also, if we're having lots of transmission in long-term care, there will be transmission in the rest of the community. So decisions often get made based on what, are the, what is the needs for everyone? What is the capacity for acute care to be able to take in those COVID units? Where is the best, peop, uh, where is the best place to provide care? For our um, for our residents and patients, so I think that there's there, we can we can come up with the best plans of what we think we're going to do based on a particular you know framework or information. Uh, however, we have to be flexible and understand that this is always a moving target based on what is going on in the rest of the community. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, in terms of transfers, it seems like an algorithm should be able to tell us what to do, but the, the scenarios are complex. There needs to be a team discussion and many things are considered in whether someone is transferred um, and what is the best thing to do for that resident and for the site and for the system and making sure that all the appropriate communication is occurring so that all parties are aware, um, also because of that public health risk during the transfer. All right, we're on the last slide here, um, or two, one slide after this, but the response team. 
we just I just wanted to make you aware we do have a long-term care response team made of some clinical um, nurses, nurse practitioners, and infection control practitioners. Um, and we come together in the outbreak and we determine in that first meeting when we come together what is it that the site needs as support. Um, there are a number of re uh, response team members that might be deployed to the site um, to help you and be shoulder to shoulder and, and work with you on um, what needs um, to be done on site and or virtually. So this point just to make that there is a lot of support available. We want sites to be successful in outbreak management and um, that's why we have so many uh, key experts and team members involved uh, together and collaborating um, so that we can take care of the residents as a system. The last question for the panel, um, and thank you so much for everybody who we've gone over by 15 minutes here. Thank you to the panelists for staying on. I think this has been a really good conversation and it's going to be, it's recorded. So for anyone who didn't get to um, see it, please forward it. Um, but here's my last question to you. If I'm a staff member, why should I feel confident coming to work? I'm going to jump in and answer that really, really quick. And and uh, and certainly it's because of my experience this last week or last week and a bit with the two outbreaks we've had. We've done a pretty good job, I think, of preparing our uh, our teams and our, our staff. You know, we've we've insured PPE. We've done uh, simulations. We've done simulations at the sites. Um, we've got a response team uh, that that's ready to go. I think that um, you know our staff as well as ourselves feel confident and that for me this last week and a bit really was reaffirmed um, in terms of that we've done a pretty good job of preparing our staff to be safe and it is paramount we want to keep our residents safe and we want to keep our staff safe i'm just going to echo that i think carmelo summarized it very well and uh... I don't have a lot to add to that. So yeah, I think everything's been done to keep the residents and the staff safe. There's a whole bunch of steps in here and uh, we're following them. We've learned from what happened early on in the outbreaks in other places and uh, we're applying all the measures and I think uh, it's showing to be quite successful here in Vancouver Island. So thanks to the efforts that everybody's making. Margaret, did you wanna add anything? I just want to say I'm very proud of the sites and how well they've worked um, to contain this virus and I know they're nervous and, and apprehensive and they've shown real courage to go into work every day and do the work and trust in that this process and trust the training that they've had. I think we can trust the training we've had to manage this. Um, so I hope that, that people can see that this works and yes, there's going to be transmission, but it can be um, minimized and we can get through this with, with, you know, with, with our, our, our skills that we've learned and honed to, to manage this. So I really appreciate everybody's efforts here and we're going to keep working towards zero transmission. Thank you. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think everyone's done an exceptional job. I'm really impressed with our teams and the staff because they have really, at the sites that are on outbreak, they've done an exceptional job with containing it um, despite all of the barriers and, and challenges. So yeah, we are in this together. We're here to support. We're very focused on making sure the staff and the residents um, are safe in this. So you should absolutely feel confident coming to work because I feel confident in our team supporting you. Thanks, everyone.